Nairobi National Museum Gate at Mosaic. You are currently standing at the entrance of Nairobi National Museum, the window to Kenya's heritage. Nairobi National Museum was established in the year 1910 by natural and cultural history enthusiasts to preserve the flora and fauna of Eastern Africa. It is therefore a mixed museum displaying both natural history and cultural history. This beautiful created mosaic is the work of Beatrice Ndomi, who was commissioned by the National Museums of Kenya in the year 2012 to capture the scope of the work and displays undertaken by Nairobi National Museum. The mosaic has representations of cultural objects, wildlife, historical figures, art, fossils, and archaeological tools, amongst others, which are presented very creatively through this piece of art. Its aesthetic appeal is intended to engender and interest in the Kenya's heritage and attract people to visit the museum itself. Mother and Child Mother and Child was carved out of stone by Francis Nangenda in the early 1970s. This piece of a mother cuddling her child is about the nurturing care of a mother. Considering that it was done a few years after independence, it symbolically represents the efforts to be put in developing a newly independent country to achieve growth and development. Elephant Sculpture This is a soapstone carving done by artist Elkana Ongesa in the year 2013. There is a rich tradition of soapstone carving among the Abagusi community of Nyanza. Other than the carving of utilitarian objects such as soap dishes, bowls, stools, and candle holders, among others, they also, produ they also produce a lot of artworks, some of which have been made have made it to the international markets. And then one of the pioneer Kisi soapstone covers is Elkana Ongesa, who was commissioned by the Kenyan government to carve this piece in the year 2013 for the Smithsonian Folklife Festivals in Washington, D.C., where Kenya was showcasing her heritage at the National Mall. Though it did not eventually travel to Washington, it conveys a powerful message of conserving wildlife, especially the elephant, which has in the recent past been a subject of massive poaching for ivory. Good installation. This centerpiece is in the Hall of Kenya and contains a tall assemblage of gourds in different sizes, shapes, and decorations collected from various parts of the country. The gourd or calabash, for that matter, is one of the most ubiquitous objects of material culture in Kenya. It is, its shapes and sizes are varied as the year functions. They are for instance used as containers for water, milk, porridge, beer, and even for storing grains. They are additionally used for serving food. They either come decorated or plain, depending on the aesthetic values of its community's usage. In commissioning such an installation, 
the Nairobi National Museum wanted to present the message of diversity of our cultures and to support the concept that a unified na nation is brought together by common cultural practices. Side blown horn, siwa. This side blown siwa is from the Swahili people of Kenya and dates back to the 17th century. It's made of ivory. This ceremonial side blown horn is one of the most distinctive items of regalia from sub Saharan Africa. There are two fine examples, one from the island of Lamu made of bronze and the ivory piece illustrated here from nearby Pate. The latter, made in the year 1688, is almost two meters long and has two articulated joints. It bears text, albeit rather corrupt, that appears to be copied from the late Mamluk inscriptions, reflecting an earlier relationship formed during the Fatimid period, that is 969 to 1171, when Egypt had played a pivotal role in the Indian Ocean trade. The sewers of Lamu and Pate are no longer used and are both housed in the museum collections in Kenya. The Lamu Siwa was last used in the year 1960 during the wedding ceremony of a prominent Lamuan family. The other wooden Siwa are to be found in villages and towns elsewhere along the Swahili coast. The siwa was perceived as a symbol of unity and the Swahili rulers acted as its sole guardians. The horns were also believed to have supernatural and magical powers in that they sound uh, thought to confer blessing on those who had it. They were also used too during prayers for rain. So closely was the siwa linked to authority within the community that any mishap that might befall it was viewed as a prelude to potential disaster for the ruler or the state. And let's move on now. Huh? To the Kalenjin community, you find that uh, these particular communities over here can be a threat to the wild animals. And therefore, this being a psych monkey, the Kalenjin people used to kill the psych monkey for them to obtain a clock for the Yalidas. And this clock is known as uh, Sambu or Sabut. And uh, what does that tell you? That uh, killing of these uh, animal species uh, by human beings will lead to the decrease of the number of tourists who are visiting our country and therefore a decrease in the number of tourists visiting our country leads to the formation of unemployment and if i become unemployed it means that uh, the generation to come uh, will decline and therefore the kenya wildlife service uh, is tr trying as much as pos possible to do what? To eradicate this form of killing wild animals. That's about uh, the Sambu or Sabut uh, from. Uh, and uh, finally, in the whole of Kenya, what do you get to learn? We come to learn about the Kyondos. Kyondos are uh, a co collection uh, from uh, different communities and majorly the Kikuyu community in the central part of Kenya. And how do we come about making these Kyondos? Kyondos are obtained from sizo plants uh, or other water hyacinths, uh, bamboo, and uh, even uh, some polythene uh, bags are, are normally used to make uh, this. Uh, 
uh, these candles. And if you can be able to have a keen look at it, you can be able to see it is somehow sophisticated inside because it has got a layer which is most helpful for making food to become warm. That's all about the whole of Kenya. I do believe you've learned of different communities here in Kenya. Ingolole circumcision mask. This mask is made of fiber and skin and was used by the Tiriki people of Western Kenya. The Tiriki circumcision is of central importance at this time. It is made from sizo fibers with palm reeds tied around it on top of the head. Originally, it was made from fibers of certain tough climbers known as lihambi. However, due to declining lihambi resources, the community has resorted to using more widely available fibers. The newly circumcised initiates make the mask themselves following a two-week period of training. And this training takes place during the period of seclusion in the forest, which starts from the time they leave home and finishes when they, co they are completely healed. They are instructed by watchful caretakers known as Batili. Only men take care of initiates. Women are not supposed to come into contact with them during the period of seclusion. The purpose of the mask is to mystify the whole initiation ritual and, this, and the initiates in particular. When the initiates are identically dressed in full seclusion regalia, it is not possible to identify them. The mask is also meant to scare women and children, some of whom may be tempted by curiosity to approach the initiates. During the year seclusion, the initiates process along major roads singing and chanting circumcision songs and slogans. This performance is known as Buhulu and the performance Bahulu meaning elders or ancestors. Therefore, Buhulu means performing the elders or ancestors dance. Participation in the dancing indicates that the initiates are engaging in past traditions. They are aping their ancestors, thereby becoming elders and prospective ancestors. Kanga, printed cloth. This cloth is made of cotton and was used by the Swahili people. It was acquired by the museum in the year 2002. Rectangular printed clothes sold in pairs, kangas, are widely used in East Africa where they are predominantly worn by women outside of the home and by both men and women indoors. The name derives from Kiswahili word for guinea for, a bird whose spotted plumage must have resembled the patterning of the first kanga. These clothes play a very special role in people's lives, both functional and symbolic, from birth, through courtship, and marriage, to old age, and finally to death. Early kangas were hand stamped using carved blocks of wood and other materials and continued to be produced in this way in various locations on the Indian Ocean coast. And this included Zanzibar and Lamu Island. Within a few years of the first kanga being made, printed versions were being imported from Europe then India, China, and Japan. The two traditions ran concurrently, at least until in the year 1970s, when the practice of hand stamp stamping ceased 
on Zanzibar. A newborn baby may be wrapped in an uncut and unstitched pair of kanga to confer prosperity, strength, and beauty to the child as a symbol of parents' love. At the funerals of women, kangas are used to convey to cover the body while it is being washed, after which the kangas may be sent to the mosque where they are the year used by female worshippers continues to bless and honor the deceased. In daily life, the combination of inscriptions and images on the kanga provides a means of suggesting thoughts and feelings which cannot be said out loud, particularly in the context of social and sexual relationships disputes and rivalry so this is a musical instrument from the luo community and it is known as abu once again i will tell you the use of uh, these guards that they were used for making musical instrument and uh, the way it is it was uh, joined together using wax from different trees and uh, on top of it it had an antelope horn and uh, whenever it would be blown it would be produce an abu sound hence it obtained the name abu and when you look at it, I want, because the government is trying to fight corruption, I want all, uh, not corruption, but tribalism. Continue. Okay, as I was saying, the government is trying to fight tribalism. I also want to fight tribalism by trying to blow this particular uh, musical instrument, assuming a maluo. There we go. You see, the sound is being projected in reference to the size of uh, the gourd. The smaller the gourd, the smaller the sound, and the bigger the gourd, the bigger the sound. Hence, the W brings about the name Abu. That's about the Luo community. Dowry Gourd Kitete. This gourd is from the Kamba people and is made of glass aluminium, cowrie shells, and leather. The renowned skill of Kamba craftsmen are most apparent in the production of utilitarian objects such as domestic gourd, known as kitete. Kamba gourds vary in size, shape, and function. Such gourds serve as beer containers or as cups for dipping into beer vats during ceremonies. Half gourds are frequently used to serve food to members of the household or visiting guests. While some gourds are smooth and cylindrical in shape, others are rounded and decorated with various surface designs. This may be inscriptions, representation of animals or plants, or simple geometric patterns. The inscriptions are drawn by specialists during using thin nail-like pieces of metal heated to red-hot temperature. Other gourds are carved using sharp tiny chisels that remove small chips from the surface of the gourd without causing damage to the surrounding area. Elaborate gourds such as this one was made by an older woman for a girl at marriage and form a part of her dowry. The young bride will take this gourd with her to her new home and will use it for the first time to feed her husband. Thereafter, it is hung up in the house as an ornamental and used for special occasions. However, a young married woman may take it to the market filled with watery porridge to show it off to her friends and neighbors. 
These dowry gourds are decorated with multicolored beads sewn together in bold, visually appealing patterns. They often have a fringe of aluminium chain and decorated lids. The long leather handles are embellished with cowrie shells. Sambu, Elder's Clock. This clock dating is from the Marakwet people. It was made in the mid-20th century and is made of skin and glass. The Sambu is a clock worn by Marakwet elders on special ceremony occasions to symbolize the status in the society. Although the Marakwet did not have traditional rulers, certain individuals gained and elevated status based on their wisdom and eloquence. They are referred to as Kiruok. The Sambu was worn by these outstanding elders during meetings such as Kok or Kokwap, where deliberations on political, ritual, legal, and other aspects of public life were held. Kiruak were regarded as professional attorneys and were often sought by disputants to plead their cases simply because they were known to be non-partisan but able to guide the cock into arriving at a just verdict. The Sambu was also worn while attending marriages and other important ceremonial occasions. The Sambu is worn by the elders to distinguish them as upholders of certain virtues thereby engendering respect from the younger members of the community. The most common type of sambu is made from either columbus or velvet monkey skins. These were used widely by other Kalenjin-speaking communities. Other clocks included strips of leopard skin or sometimes the skin of the cheetah or other wild cat that are associated with bravery and leadership. The wearers were often persons who had distinguished themselves in war. The clock illustrated here made specifically was made specifically for Paramount Chief Chemutut to be worn during a visit to Her Majesty the Queen in the early 1960s. A similar one was made for Jomo Kenyatta, Kenya's first president, in recognition of his leadership status. Water pot, Isongo. This pot is from the Isuha community of Western Kenya and is used for storing water. It is made by women out of clay. Clay containers among the Isuha community are best known for storing water. These pots are made pervious so, thus, so that water inside keeps cool due to evaporation on at the outside wall of the pot. The tradition of pottery has a strong place in the community and those distinguished in the art are highly regarded. The Isuha made the pots of various sizes for diverse uses. And these include pots of uh, liyika for cooking meat or fish, ikhafuha for cooking flour and making meals, commonly known as obusuma, Olunasulo or Isati for brewing a little beer. Olulemo for brewing a lot of beer. Eshikaye 
which was used as soup plate and olusio from which beer was drunk with tubes. Pottery making among the Isuha has expanded beyond traditional utilitarian functional to encompass other non-utilitarian but aesthetic functions such as flower vases and tourist art. Pestle and mortar. This pestle and mortar is from the Meru community and is generally used to grind cereals such as millet and sorghum into flour which was then used for cooking either ugali, a common Kenyan staple food, or porridge. The pestle and mortar are made of hardwood. Mortars and pestles are still used in cooking up to the present day. Ligisa, headdress. This piece is made from skin, glass, cowrie shells and fibers and was used by the Luo people. The Ligisa is made for important women in the society and it defines the value and the status of the wearer. Value is expressed through respect bestowed upon her by members of the society. It follows that a woman who wears the ligisa is well-mannered and dignified as befits an older woman and must be accorded courtesy and respect from others. The ligisa is worn exclusively by those who have passed through specific socio-cultural stages of life. Formally, the Ligisa mainly adorned the wives of chiefs, Ruodi, important village elders, Jodongweng, or wealthy persons, Okebe. Among the Luo, the wife of an elder, leader, or a chief must be given the same respect as her husband. The Luo customary understanding of power was based on the relative beauty of a man's wife. Hence the Ligisa is decorated beautifully. The accompanying clothing called Abola, which was made from goat skin, was also decorated with beads and worn across the left shoulders hanging over the left side of the chest. However, the importance of the Ligisa has declined in the contemporary Luo society, rapidly being overtaken by the current Western ways of dressing. Today, it is mainly made and worn by young brides who have chosen to marry in the traditional way. Because the Ligisa represents certain law values, it is made to order exclusively by specialist artisans, highly trained people who have followed a proper apprenticeship. The Ligisa is made by firstly peeling three or four strands of fiber from a banana leaf. Tiny, soft sizo threads are then coiled meticulously around these strands to make the padded bands. These bands are in turn stitched together side by side using tiny threads to form different patterns. Glass beads are sewn onto cut to fit skin, which is then covered and stitched to the pad. The beadwork patterns are created by the wearer.